In case you haven't noticed, this country has a housing affordability crisis and I haven't really tackled this topic until now. So today I'm gonna to define the issue, talk about how we got here, enumerate all the problems that stem from the housing shortage, and then we're gonna get into talking about solutions, including how you personally can get involved, and it's all up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome. And this one is a topic suggestion from a particular group of viewers, but I'll come back to that later in the video. But I'm just gonna say right up front, this is it. This is the cause you've been waiting for. You often hear young people don't vote, they aren't politically engaged. Well, I submit to you that housing affordability is the issue that galvanizes younger folks like no other issue seems to do at all. Because it's not lost on me that the most reliably popular videos I make are the ones where I talk about places that have good transit, that are walkable, bikeable, and that are relatively affordable. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about why that is. And I think it really comes down to people want to be in a place where they can be true to their values, and be less car dependent. And there simply aren't enough of those places that you can afford if you make any kind of normal wage or salary. So first, let's look at some data so we can confirm that this is not an imaginary problem. I probably shouldn't have to do this since I'm guessing every single person watching this has either been house hunting or looking for a place to rent sometime in the last 10 to 15 years, including me, multiple times. I mean, we are all living through this. According to Zillow, home values nationwide have increased 109% since 2010. And that's bad given that household incomes are only up around 50% over the same time frame. An absolutely critical part of this discussion though is that housing cost increases are not distributed uniformly. And I'm gonna talk over some of the worst offending metro areas during this part. See if you can find a common denominator. Because what's crucial to this whole issue is that demand for housing and the supply of housing are wildly out of balance in the regions of the US where the affordability crisis is most severe. You'll sometimes hear some very intelligent person say that the housing shortage is an illusion because if you add up all the vacant units in the US, you end up with a number that's far more than enough to shelter all the unhoused. I can't even imagine someone who makes that kind of argument even intends to be taken seriously. I mean, to say there's a geographic dimension to the housing affordability crisis is vastly oversimplifying. There's definitely a spatial mismatch because the biggest housing shortages just happen to be in places where there are strong job markets, good transportation options, and urban amenities that can support car-free and car-light living, or as I like to call it, just living in a city. So the spatial component of this makes it hard to define the magnitude of the problem. I'm gonna recommend this piece from Salim Firth on the Market Urbanism website, which explores two different claims about the housing shortage. One, that the aggregate number is four million. The other, 20 million. It gets into some wonky stuff about the varying methodologies. The article is from 2022 and you might be asking, given that it sounds like the floor is 4 million, why is Vice President Harris only proposing to support the construction of 3 million new dwelling units? That question is a little out of scope for today, but I just point out that the Harris Walls proposal is for 3 million more dwelling units than you'll find anywhere in Project 2025 or Agenda 47 or whatever you think it is that a Republican administration would actually do. Okay, so we've established that there is a housing shortage somewhere between 3 million and 20 million units and not spatially uniform. Let's talk about why this is bad. The way it plays out in the real world is people compete for a limited number of available units by bidding up the price. This manifests in things like long lines at apartment open houses in New York with absurd broker's fees and bidding wars on homes for sale that end up going for hundreds of thousands of dollars over the asking price. So the housing crisis is actually not completely bad if you're a rental broker in New York or someone who already owns a home in a high demand area. For everyone else though, it's basically soul destroying. Applying for rentals and putting in offers on homes and losing out over and over is time consuming, yeah, but it's also emotionally and financially draining. Not being able to afford a home at all is an actual phenomenon that exists and that manifests in spending way too high a proportion of your income on rent or a mortgage to the point where you can't afford to fund your retirement or your well-being. Or spending years on wait lists for income qualified housing in the city where you actually want to live. Or moving far away from friends and family and super commuting instead because it's the only way you can make ends meet. Or simply not being able to live in a proper dwelling unit at all in 2024 in one of the richest countries the world has ever seen. 
How the housing shortage affects individuals is probably the most salient thing, just because all of us have probably been impacted by it on some level. But the fact that the crisis is most acute in the very cities that are best equipped to support a low carbon way of life is absolutely disastrous for climate policy. I love these maps that show the way household carbon footprints vary between urban neighborhoods with higher density and more efficient transportation characteristics and low density car dependent suburban neighborhoods. Now let's turn to the question of why there's a housing shortage. The real answer is the reasons vary a bit from city to city, but the main thing is, in far too many places, it's flat out illegal to build multifamily housing. I'll leave a link to this New York Times article from 2019 because the visuals are really good and it explains the unsavory history of single family zoning, or you might call it exclusionary zoning. Basically language in your city's code that dictates where land can only be used for detached, single family homes and in a lot of cities, it's the majority of the land area. And the article explains how exclusionary zoning really turbocharges the housing affordability crisis. But it is from five years ago and Minneapolis and Portland, for example, effectively eliminated single-family zoning in 2021. Another fun resource is the National Zoning Atlas, which is a work in progress, but it lets you explore different cities and really get a sense for how much land is zoned for single family and how the areas zoned for multifamily are often along what are considered transit corridors, but are often also busy arterials with bad air quality, lots of noise, a disproportionate number of crashes, and a lot of other extremely fun stuff. Seattle is a great example of this, but just know that the landscape on this stuff is changing rapidly. Washington State passed House Bill 1110 last year, which compels cities to update their code and allow higher density in areas currently zoned for single family. The fact that some of these overhauls happen at the state level rather than the local level really points to how much potential housing advocacy and zoning reform have as issues with a broad-based political constituency. It's one thing for urbanists or progressive policy think tanks to embrace reforms that allow for increased density in housing choices, but it's another to see a libertarian outfit like Reason essentially cheerlead for housing reform. But it makes sense. Zoning amendments like Portland's residential infill project are aimed at increasing supply and expanding housing choices, but they also give individual property owners more freedom to decide what to build on their own land, and policies that give individuals more liberty and help achieve big macro goals tend to be political winners. If you haven't realized by now, what I'm talking about is Yimbyism. Yes in my backyard for the uninitiated. I think this is the first time I've ever said the word Yimby on this channel. Not because I'm not on board with the cause, but just because it's kind of a goofy sounding word. But it is easy to grasp. Everyone knows what a NIMBY is. It's someone who would prefer that their neighborhood was frozen in amber, and maybe on a deeper level, they want to keep the supply of homes low so that their own home is worth more. Yimby says the opposite. Having more neighbors is good. More density means more urban amenities, more viable businesses, a more vibrant neighborhood, and all those things, not to mention the ability of an individual to have more freedom to build what they want on their own land. Well, all those things make for a richer society. Okay, so we've established that housing supply is in fact an actual problem, and we still need to talk about the really meteoric rise of YIMBY as a political movement, how it's playing out in our politics currently, and how you can get involved. But first, all the usual ways to engage the channel and connect on the apps. Also, if you're watching this on or before Wednesday, August 28th, there's a very important live online event happening that evening. It's being put on by Yimbys for Harris, and it's going to feature an amazing variety of very cool speakers. U.S. Senators, big city mayors, people dressed up in bee costumes, even YouTubers who talk about cities and transportation, apparently. So I don't know if you're aware of how prominent the housing crisis has become in the Harris Walls platform, but it was pretty evident at the Democratic National Convention. I am a very big Harris supporter for more reasons than I can count, and the focus on bringing down the cost of housing is just one more thing. You can learn a lot more on the call, and I am going to attempt to stream the whole thing on this channel while I'm also participating on the call, so wish me luck. Okay, and I mentioned earlier that this video came from a viewer topic suggestion, which is probably understating it a bit. 
The fine folks at Yimby Action reached out about me doing a video around the housing affordability crisis and talking a bit about the work they do. They actually offered to compensate me for doing this, but yeah, I'm doing it for free. Yimby Action is an organization where I'm not only fully aligned with the mission, but I think Yimbyism, for lack of a better term, just has massive potential to get political factions that don't normally agree on a lot of things, like say progressives and libertarians, on the same page. Yimby Action is a national organization that has local chapters all over the US, so it's a network that provides tools and training, but maybe most important, it's a community of people who care deeply about the housing crisis and are ready to do something about it. Did I mention that membership gets you into the Yimby Slack? That Slack is worth a monthly donation all by itself. And you can actually become a Yimby Action member by donating or volunteering. This is the largest pro-housing organization in the country, so if you believe having a roof over your head in the year of our Lord 2024 should be a fundamental human right, I strongly endorse becoming part of this movement. By the way, the organization itself is not making an endorsement in the presidential race, but the executive director is one of the featured speakers on the Yimbys for Harris call, so make of that what you will. So I want to spend a bit of time talking about national legislative efforts that Yimby Action is involved in. They're actually advocating for a variety of pro-housing bills, but I want to talk about this Build More Housing Near Transit Act. For this, it's helpful to know about the Federal Transit Administration's capital investment grants programs, specifically New Starts, which is for big capital projects like new heavy rail or light rail lines, and Small Starts, which tends to be things like streetcar and bus rapid transit. When I was in consulting, I occasionally worked on the research and analysis for these kinds of grant applications. And believe me when I tell you, the FTA asked for a truly massive amount of documentation around things like cost estimates, environmental benefits, projected economic impact, and yes, adjacent land use. And all that feeds into the scoring that the FTA uses to decide which projects to award funding to. The land use component does have some elements related to population density, transit supportiveness, and even a bit of housing affordability in the criteria. But the Build More Housing Around Transit Act would really bring the supply and affordability piece to the forefront in the overall scoring, really rewarding projects where there have been local efforts to align land use and zoning policies to encourage more market rate and affordable housing near the proposed transit project. At the bottom of this is the idea of location efficiency, which I did make a couple of videos about last year. It's the idea that housing that's in close proximity to transit, that's walkable and bikeable, and has a mix of uses, lets you economize on transportation. And this is huge because owning, operating, maintaining, insuring, and finding a place to park a car are so expensive and have such a huge impact on your ability to afford basic things like housing or the occasional night out at your favorite restaurant. So it's great to see Yimby Action putting some of their advocacy weight behind this. The other congressional bill Yimby Action is supporting that I want to talk about is the People Over Parking Act. Let's go to the website of Long Beach, California's finest, U.S. Representative Robert Garcia, who introduced the bill. It's very straightforward, and I'll just paraphrase. In the case of a newly constructed or substantially reconstructed residential, retail, commercial, or industrial structure that is located not more than half a mile from a fixed guideway transit stop, the owner of such structure or project shall have the sole discretion to determine how many automobile parking spots to provide. There's a little more to it, but I love the simplicity. And you might ask, what role could the federal government possibly have in telling local governments what they should be building near transit stops and how much parking they should require? Well, when the federal government is making billion dollar investments in public transit to help achieve all kinds of objectives related to economic development, air quality, climate, and housing affordability, I'd say yeah, they do have a role in making sure local regulations aren't arbitrarily cumbersome and restrictive in ways that defeat all of those objectives. This is why I think parking reform and YIMBY have so much potential as urbanist political movements. If you're like me and you care about cities and you think they're just better when more people can afford to live in them, these issues are just really slam dunks. But even if you're someone who doesn't pay attention to urbanism, it's very simple and common sense to say people should have more freedom to decide what to build on their property, how much to build, and whether to include off-street parking at all. 
As someone who cares deeply about all this stuff, this really is such an exciting moment to be living through, and make no mistake, Yimby is having an absolute moment. It's deeply gratifying to be part of it, and I encourage everyone to get involved. It really is our time. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons for your direct support, which really lets me advocate for the things I really care about, regardless of whether I'm getting paid for it or not. Fear not. The checks from the VPN providers and safety razor manufacturers, always clear. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.